Good morning. Good morning. Good to see you all here today. Hope you'll take a moment and register your attendance. There should be registration pads on each pew. There are several announcements in the life of the church in your bulletin. And want you to be a part of those things that you can be a part of. Want to lift up the summer music activities with kids. Happens this week. Hello. I think I'm on. I'm on, but not loud. Okay. Summer music activities with kids is happening this week, Tuesday through Friday. And uh, they can still register, right? Okay, Brenda has a sign-up sheet. Grab her after <coughs> church if you haven't signed up uh, to come. We already have 17 signed up. 17 so far. So be, become a part. Um, Tuesday night, long-range planning begins. We'll have 6 to 7 o'clock, and I'm serious about that. We'll be here for one hour maximum. Um, what we're going to do is Tuesday night, those of you who are a part of long-range planning, and that includes anyone who wants to be here Tuesday night in the fellowship hall, we're going to set up some committees to look at some specific work areas. We're going to look at some general demographics of the area that are provided by Mission Insight, and then we're going to decide on a meeting schedule to do some long-range planning to set some goals as to how we're going to be in ministry, some program uh, priorities that we need to have, some facilities and, and uh, resources priorities we need to have, those kinds of things. And you're invited to be a part of this in whatever way you can be. If you're able to be there on Tuesday night and to take part, we encourage you to do that. If you can't, we're going to push this information out and feel free to join the process as we move forward. Also, um, if you feel like you just can't be a part of these meetings, we need you to be praying for us as we go through this process of discerning how God is going to best use the resources of our congregation to proclaim the gospel in this community uh, in the future. So be a part of the long-range planning process in whatever form you can so that we can uh, have all participation that we can. Next Sunday... Uh, the children will uh, sing as part of our, our worship service. The kids from uh, SMAC will be a part of that presentation. And immediately following the service, those who are going to summer camp, we have four children and one adult, will be headed to summer camp. And we need you to be praying for them that they'll have a great experience of the Spirit at summer camp as well. Any other announcements that need to be shared? Yes, ma'am. Sunday school is a very important part of the life of the church, and there's an invitation to a relatively new class. There are other more established classes, and hope you can be a part of that. In the age of Facebook, we're going to try something a little bit new. Uh, tomorrow morning, we're going to start with the first official post in a group called the Summer Bible Reading Group on Facebook. If you don't have any idea what I'm talking about, just go to our Facebook page. If you do Facebook, click the word group and you can join the group. Uh, we're going to start with a study of James. Uh, it'll be over five weeks, and we will read through the entire letter of James five times in five weeks uh, as a way of internalizing it and as a way of becoming familiar with it, and hope that you'll be a part of that study uh, as in addition to Sunday school and other things. So we're trying to figure out ways that we can still be together even though we're traveling a little bit in the summer, even though we're here, there, and yonder, uh, we can still be engaged with each other and still be a part of Bible study through the summer. Now if we'll stand for the call to worship. <laughs> the call to worship is in your bulletin. Please join me.
Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will, and we have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us from a joyful obedience through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love for us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. If the children would come forward with Ashley for children's time. Good morning. Oh, there's lots of us today. Okay, I have a question. Who can tell me what a law is? That's right. It's a rule that people must follow or they will face consequences, huh? Well, believe it or not, <coughs> there are some really silly laws. I looked on the internet and I found some, you will, won't believe this. Okay. In Arkansas, it is against the law to honk a car horn at a sandwich shop after 9 p.m. Can you believe that? And in Indiana, it is illegal to catch a fish with your bare hands. I know. In South Dakota, it is against the law to fall asleep in a cheese factory. <laughs> oh, Miss Beaver will like this one. It's against the law to sing off key in North Carolina. <laughs> okay, and our last one, this might be disappointing to some of you, but in Texas, it's illegal to sell your eyeballs. <laughs> oh. I thought we'd be disappointed. Okay, so I think y'all can all agree those are some silly laws, but you know what? That's nothing new. 
even back in the day when Jesus was alive, they had some pretty silly laws. There was a group of religious leaders called the Pharisees who were keepers of the law of Moses. And they believed that keeping the law was everything. And they also believed that their own understanding and teaching about the law was the only correct teaching. Jesus was quite often opposed by the Pharisees and was accused of breaking the law of Moses all the time, especially the law regarding the Sabbath. Who knows what the Sabbath is? That's right. God gave us one day a week to rest. He created the world in six days, and on the seventh day, what did he do? He rested. He knows how important it is that we all have a day to rest and reconnect with him, and that's why he gave us the Sabbath day. And Sunday is the Sabbath day for most Christians today. It's the day we worship and then just kind of take it easy, huh? Well, one Sabbath day, Jesus and his disciples were walking through some fields of grain, and his disciples were hungry, and they began to break off some of the heads of grain to eat it. And the Pharisees saw, and they said to Jesus, Look, why are they breaking the law by harvesting grain on the Sabbath? And Jesus realized how foolish this was of the Pharisees to compare breaking off a few grains to, eating, to eat with harvesting the whole crop. And Jesus was sure to tell them, the Sabbath was made to meet the needs of people and not the people to meet the requirements of the Sabbath. One of the Ten Commandments says, remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. But can you imagine a law so silly that you could not do a good deed like killing someone because it was the Sabbath? Surely that's not what God meant. So let us pray. Dear God, please help us to keep the Sabbath holy. But also help us to follow the example of Jesus by showing love and compassion to others. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let us pray. Merciful God, receive these gifts, tithes, and offerings as an expression of our faith and trust in you. Allow these to be used to further the work of your church in this community and far beyond. You have blessed us beyond measure, and now we share in your work through these offerings. In Christ we pray. Amen.
Let us repeat together our affirmation of faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. We come now to the celebrations and concerns of the church. As we do so, we invite you to share those concerns and celebrations. <coughs> yes, sir. <laughs> wow. 
celebrating the anniversary, and that comes with a lot of responsibility for two weeks. Okay. <laughs> Pretty good. Well, we celebrate your life together and the future you, you have together, and we say praise be to God. And for those two weeks of being a, a managing director of the whole operation, we say, Lord, hear our prayer. Are there others? Yes, ma'am. Ann McGill uh, fell and uh, has fractured her hip and needs our prayers, and we say together, Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Yes, ma'am. The family of Ruby Stoltz, uh, and Ruby is on hospice care, and they also have a daughter. Her daughter is, uh, has cancer, and so the family really needs our prayerful support at this time, and we say together, Lord have, mercy. Lord, have mercy. Yes, sir. Prayers for redirection and thanksgiving. <laughs> Praise be to God. Praise be to God. Uh, prayer was lifted up for uh, Howard Jordan this yes. morning at the early service. Yes. He was involved in a motorcycle deer ex accident. Uh, and as humorous as that may sound, it is not. Uh, but we uh, pray for him as he goes through a time of recovery. And we say together, Lord, hear our prayer. Also, a prayer of thanksgiving for the beginning of a new job. Uh, Jeremy Hathaway is beginning a new position at Baylor University in August. And we celebrate that with him and his family and pray for their transition to be uh, as pain-free as possible. And we say together, thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. And I may get in trouble, but I want to tell you uh, a couple of things that have to do with the Texas Recovers. Texas Recovers is uh, the system that the annual conference is participating in, is set up to funnel uh, volunteers into this area to help with Hurricane Harvey restoration and recovery efforts. There are volunteers who come from all over the country. They, they dial a 800 number or go online and register. And there have been two teams that have been housed over in Brazoria at the Brazoria Methodist Church and have gone out and worked. Uh, we are on the list to host a team and hopefully we'll have one or two before the end of the summer. But uh, Bob Swibel was able to go and share some of our own Texas history with some of these folks. Uh, he went as uh, Stephen F. Austin and uh, shared some Texas history with some people from Indiana. Indiana and Kansas. So uh, just another part of the ministry of all uh, things working together and us being in ministry together with our sister churches. Uh, there are many who are still in need of help. And if you know of some people who are running out of volunteers and help, uh, they can go to Texas Recovery at the conference website and register for help and get on the list as well. Uh, the conference plans to be in this activity of volunteers and resources for a minimum of three years. And so uh, if, if you have uh, people who, who need help, please have them uh, refer them to me or to the conference website as well. And for all of that ministry that's going on, we say together, thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. As you might know, uh, at annual conference, there was a, a amazing report about how uh, the conference responded to that uh, hurricane. There's amazing reports about how we're engaging in ministry to uh, children in various places. 
if you uh, look online, you'll see a video uh, where Neil Bush and uh, representatives of the Barbara Bush Literacy Foundation made a presentation to annual conference and invited us to be in partnership with them working in the lives of children. Um, one of the most heartwarming and transforming uh, reports was given by a friend of mine uh, who's at First Methodist Church in Marshall. And as he gave his report, he was telling the story of a new program between First Methodist Church Marshall and Wiley College. Okay, Wiley College is a historically black college. Uh, most of us know that who lived in Texas for a number of years. It is a, a, a strong church-related uh, church institution. I don't know if you're aware that it's a Methodist college, actually. Um, and it has been serving the, the East Texas community for many, many years. I had a friend who was appointed to First Methodist Church in Marshall a long time ago, and uh, about 25 or 30 years ago. And he said, you know, one of the first things they did was took me down into the basement, and they showed me the book. And the book that they opened up is to kind of shock you. And they opened it up and showed me where families had pledged the labor of their slaves to build the building that you're standing in. Okay? Now think about that. You have a historically black university. You have a church with a history that most churches in that time had. And the church now has partnered with Wiley College and has an internship program where they have identified and are sending six African-American college students to seminary to become pastors in the annual conference. They are interning and helping to lead worship in that church that slaves helped build. Can you see how the gospel has come into reality in the midst of that situation to bring about healing and redemption in the midst of that history that everyone tends to ignore and then run over. People are working on behalf of the gospel and we give thanks for their witness and we give thanks for the way that the response to that witness has gone and we give thanks that we here in Columbia are part of even that which goes on up in East Texas because we're all one church serving one God for one purpose of proclaiming the gospel. For our role in the ministry of the church, the larger church, the worldwide church, we say, thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Let us turn our hearts and minds towards God as we go to him in prayer. Merciful Father, we come to you humbled, humbled by the activities of life all around us, humbled by the way that you move in the lives of friends and family, humbled by the way that your spirit brings healing and wholeness to those that we know and pray for, humbled by the work of the Holy Spirit in churches around us and volunteers coming from far away to share your love with those who were devastated by the hurricane. We pray, O oh God, that you would enter our hearts and enter our midst, give us clarity of purpose, and give us an opportunity to serve you by serving others. We pray that as the church moves into the summer, that you will lead us, that you will help us, that you will empower us to reach out in concern and service to those that we encounter and to be the witness that this community needs. We pray these things in the name of our Savior, who teaches us to say together when we pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
join in together with the prayer of illumination. Living God, help us to hear the scripture so that we may truly understand that understanding we may believe and believing we may follow in all faithfulness and obedience, seeking your honor and glory in all that we do. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Our sermon, you may be seated. Our sermon text this morning is taken from the Gospel of Mark, beginning at the second chapter, verse 23, through chapter 3, verse 6. One Sabbath, he was going through the grain field, and as they made their way, his disciples began to pluck heads of grain. The Pharisees said to him, Look, why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? And he said to them, have you never read what David did when he and his companions were hungry and in need of food? He entered the house of God when Abiathar was high priest and ate the bread of the presence, which it is not lawful for any but the priest to eat. And he gave some to his companions. Then he said to them, The Sabbath was made for humankind and not humankind for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Again, he entered the synagogue, and a man was there who had a withered hand. They watched him to see whether he would cure him on the Sabbath, so that they might accuse him. And he said to the man who had the withered hand, Come forward. Then he said to them, Is it lawful to good, do good or to do harm on the Sabbath, to save life or to kill? But they were silent. He looked around at them with anger. He was grieved at their hardness of heart, and he said to the man, Stretch out your hand. He stretched it out, and his hand was restored. The Pharisees went out and immediately conspired with the Herodians against him how to destroy him. This is the word of God for the people of God. In six days, God created the earth, and on the seventh day, he rested. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days, do all your work, but on the Sabbath day, don't do any work. Simple, straightforward, easy to understand. A declaration of why we keep Sabbath and a declaration that we are to do it to honor God. So Jesus and his disciples are on their way. We don't really know where they're on their way to, but we know that as they're on their way, they pass through a grain field and they begin to pluck the heads of grain and eat them. Jesus appears to be a troublemaker. It's a Sabbath and his disciples are eating grain that they pick with their own hands as they travel down the road and it catches the eye of those people who know the law well, the Pharisees, and they are upset. Jesus is a troublemaker. Apparently, he doesn't pay attention to the law. Apparently, he's above the law or beyond the law. The Pharisees get themselves worked up, and they begin to get other people worked up, and they confront Jesus about this. Well, you know, if you think about it, they're right. Jesus is a troublemaker. Because Jesus is always doing things that seem to be in contradiction to the law. Think about it for a minute. He lets his disciples do this with the grain and eat it as they walk through the field. And you're not supposed to work on the Sabbath. Jesus talks to women who are foreigners, Samaritans at that. And you're not supposed to do that because you're not even supposed to have anything in common with these foreign people. Jesus uh, heals on the Sabbath. Not supposed to do that as a healer because that's work. Jesus heals the children of foreigners who come to him who don't have any place in the, in the life of Israel. He, he heals the, the, the child of a Roman centurion and he heals a child of a Syrophoenician who has no relationship whatsoever, no claim on him. This is kind of a troublemaker. Jesus 
also touches dead people, makes himself unclean. He doesn't make his, his disciples fast. He, he continuously seems to get in trouble with those people who know the law the best and who seem to represent God's law in the life of the community of Israel on a regular basis. Jesus is a troublemaker, and in fact, in the words of the Pharisee Buford T. Justice, what we are dealing with here is a total lack of respect for the law, isn't it? At least that's the way the Pharisees see it. But in Matthew's gospel, it says Jesus came not to abolish the law, but to fulfill the law. So the question for us is, how is the how are these acts that apparently disobey the law in the eyes of the Pharisees and in the eyes of the, the community of Israel in Jesus' time, how are these acts fulfilling the law that God intended? How is Jesus not abolishing but fulfilling the will of God by doing these things and allowing these things to happen in the community and in the life of Israel? I think to answer that, we have to see where Jesus is when it comes to the question of the law. And there's no better place to see where Jesus is on the question of the law than to look at the 10th chapter of the Gospel of Luke. There, a lawyer stands up and asks Jesus, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus asks him, you, you know, you read the law, what does it reveal to you that you have to do? And the lawyer proudly says, you shall worship the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love God, love neighbor. That's it. That's where the heart of the law is for Jesus. The lawyer, trying to justify himself, he comes back and he says, but what, what does that mean? And you know the story of the Good Samaritan. Jesus tells that story to illustrate what it means to love God and to love neighbor and to serve both. That should sound familiar. That's your mission statement. To love God, to love neighbor, and to serve both. The story of the Good Samaritan. That's what he tells them to, to help people understand what it means to fulfill the law. Now let's look at what Jesus does. Jesus and his disciples are coming across the field. And some disciples are hungry and they break off the heads of grain and they begin to eat it. And Jesus allows it to happen because the Sabbath is not made, the, the man is not made to keep the Sabbath, but the Sabbath is made for the enjoyment and the benefit of man. You see, Jesus understands what the Sabbath is all about. It's not about keeping you from doing things. It's not about preventing you from being God's children. It's about providing for you a respite and a, a place where you can stop and reflect on what it means to be God's child. It isn't about keeping the rules. It's about keeping the relationship and being there in that time with God when everything else is put aside and we are in God's presence. And we are allowed to be with God and not distracted by the labors of life. And not distracted by the other things that come into our world. But to simply have time to rest and be with God. Jesus answers the Pharisees with those words. He says the Sabbath is made for man, not man for the Sabbath. You've got the law turned on its head Pharisees what it means to fulfill the law is to love God to love neighbor to serve both what it means to fulfill the law is that God offers opportunity and mercy at every hand you know when Jesus talks about what it is to fulfill the law he never calls for stricter enforcement and he never calls for harsher penalties he never doubles down on what it means to be within the law. He always comes on the side of those who are in need and those who are in peril. When Jesus is faced with a choice of whether or not 
to obey the law or to love a human being by providing healing and wholeness and conversation and forgiveness, he always errs on the side of the human being. He always is possessed of love and mercy and redemption. He always fulfills the law by offering the love and mercy of, G of God in these situations. You know, there's one occasion where Jesus even interrupts a perfectly legitimate stoning. I mean, these people have caught this woman dead to rights. She's in bed with the wrong man. She deserves to be stoned. The law says to be stoned. Everything about it is absolutely 110%. She is there. These people are fully implementing the law. They are obeying what is commanded. And Jesus interrupts that. He writes something in the dirt. We don't know exactly what he writes. We think it's the Ten Commandments, but I don't know for sure. He stands up, he looks around, he says, let the one who is without sin cast the first stone. They all drop their rocks and go home. And then he says to the woman, where are your accusers? She says, I don't know. He says, neither do I accuse you. Now go and sin no more. You see, in the midst of that whole situation where Jesus would have been just perfectly fine to be a normal human being and allow the law to be carried out, he intervened in order to redeem a life. He intervened in order to fulfill the law. What the law is really about is offering people an opportunity to respond to God's love and to accept God's mercy. One of the reports at annual conference this year was about restorative justice. And you know the word restorative justice is different than criminal justice, right? In the criminal justice system, we convict people and we send them to prison and we give them an opportunity to serve out their punishment, their term of, of uh, sentencing. It can often be a time when people get harder and harder and meaner and meaner against the system that put them there because they feel abandoned. It is part of the system, though, because some people don't respond and some people are just there. There's another thing that the church tries to promote at every opportunity, which is called restorative justice. Part of restorative justice is things like Kairos ministry and other ministries that go into prison to offer the gospel to people, to give them an opportunity to not only serve their penalty, but to make their their peace with God and to realign their lives with God. Part of restorative justice is to give people an opportunity to not only pay their debt, but to acknowledge the difference that is in them to restore them to society. You see, the difference is between using the law to simply punish, and I am oversimplifying, Write me letters later, but I am oversimplifying. Of using the law to punish or the law to restore and reform. Some of you know that very well. Some of us have experienced that in our lives. There are those times that we get into trouble and we are left in study hall just to sit there. There are those times that we get into trouble and someone comes and works with us and works through that trouble that we were in. There are some folks who are put into the system because of behavioral problems in our schools and in our society, and they are, they are just there to serve their time. And then there are those people who will take advantage of the opportunity that is given them to learn from their mistakes and be restored to society in a good way. I'm pretty sure Jesus would be all about that restoring side. I'm pretty sure of that because that's what he does in my life and that's what he offers to do in our lives. When we come to those places where we have sinned against God and we deserve to be punished, Jesus extends to us the truth of the gospel which convicts us of our wrongdoing. He doesn't excuse our wrongdoing. He doesn't push it off to the side. 
He convicts us of that which we have sinned about. Sometimes we say he breaks our hearts. And then he restores us to a right relationship with God. It is an act of mercy and grace beyond our comprehension. But it's the difference between being punished for our sins and redeeming someone from their, from their actions and from their sins and restoring them to full life. I think when Jesus says that he comes not to abolish the law but to fulfill the law, he wants us to see how the law is meant to restore the right relationship that human beings need to have with God in order to flourish in life. Jesus gives himself so that we might be restored. The Pharisees, on the other hand, watch him. They want to see when he breaks the law so they can plot against him. They want to see the ways that he is disobedient and to use that against him in the eyes of the community of Israel. They even lay in wait when he goes on Sabbath to worship. And they're there and they're watching someone who has a withered hand and they're saying, I bet he, I bet he doesn't do it. Surely he wouldn't heal a man on the Sabbath because we'd have him dead to rights if he did that. But you know what? He does it. Because that's who Jesus is. When there are those who are suffering and need to be restored, he does that. And oh, by the way, if Jesus had wanted to simply win the legal argument with them about the grain in the field in Deuteronomy 23, 25, it specifically says that if you pick grain and you don't pick too much and take it home and you don't put it in a container, it's not harvesting and it's not work. It specifically says that that's okay, even on Sabbath, because you're not harvesting. There's a difference between harvesting and snacking. Aren't you glad we have a Savior who knows the difference between harvesting and snacking? So he could have won the point of the law argument if he wanted to. But he chose to make a larger point. That the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. That Jesus is Lord on the Sabbath and every other day of the week. That Jesus and the mercy of God are available on the Sabbath and every other day of the week. Because that's how God is. God is available and ready and waiting to restore life and to restore us to a right relationship so that we might enjoy and flourish in our lives in relationship with our Creator. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. We come now to the great thanksgiving, if you'll join. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, God Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from this all of you, 
This is my blood of a new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit and your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen. We, many as we are, are one body in Christ Jesus, and when we break this bread, it's a means of sharing the body of Christ. When we share the cup, it's a means of sharing the blood of Christ. The acolytes would come and assist in serving. I remind us all that this is not the table of this congregation. It is the table of our Lord and Savior, and all who call upon his name are welcome to come and receive the sacrament. The body of Christ is broken for you. The body of Christ is broken for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. There we go. I'm going to turn around right here. Turn around right there. The body of Christ broken for you.
Let us pray. Merciful God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Grant that by the strength of your spirit, we may go into the world to give ourselves to others in your name. Amen. As we prepare to sing our closing this morning, we offer you an opportunity to respond to the leading of God in your life. If you'd like to make a public profession of your faith, we invite you to come forward and to do that. If you'd like to make this your church home, we invite you to come and take the vows of membership. We'll stand and sing together. You are the church of Jesus Christ. You are his children. Go into the world and live your lives as children of God. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.